<laughs> I was about to say, I heard you clearing your throat in you the back. Hear, like, how did we not figure out how to mute that? No, <laughs> you you are <laughs> muted, but only we hear it. They don't hear that. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you were trying to make it extra extra loud, clearing your throat and everything? Yeah. Um, but what's up, no one, no one heard that, so no one guessed that but me. So Cool. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's been a, it's been a while. Uh, we since had, Winter Clash, right? Yeah, since Winter Clash. How was... Uh, I know you went to like Portugal. We didn't really get to officially catch up since... Um, since winter clash uh, i know you went to portugal afterwards with the mesmer guys how was that trip yeah it was good it was a short trip we went there for six days the first day we got there we flew in we checked into the airbnb so we just like rested and like stayed chill after uh winter clash just to recoup and then you need a recovery days, day at least yeah and then five days of like skating every day and it was good it was really productive got a lot of stuff done everyone was dead at the end of it uh, <laughs> some people went back sick yeah, because uh, they were working through like sometimes at winter clash, like some sickness goes around. People are coughing and stuff. And some of us had that, but we just like skated through it. So like with the exhaustion and that at the end, like uh, it was a little it was a bit much, but it was good. So we have something coming out with that and I'm very excited for that. But how about you? How have you been? I've been good. I was not in Portugal. I was in New York. Boring, boring. I know. Um, but yeah, no, everything's been cool. I'm waiting for the weather to kind of catch back up because it's springtime now. So we get, if anybody's familiar with New York or Northeast, springtime. yes, East Coast weather, it'll be legit like 70 degrees Fahrenheit one day and the next day it would be like snowing. So trying yeah. to work through that and get, get as much skating as possible. But it's kind of frustrating when you think it's going to be nice out and then the weekend comes and it's rainy or cold or whatever. So you know, got to be patient. Another like month or so, and we'll be in the clear. But until yeah, then, it's, a, it's like the tough season in New York right now because you just had like the whole winter, and you're everyone's excited for some warmer weather, and you get like a taste of it, but then it goes back to the winter. So it's that like I'm very familiar with that period where you're just like yeah. wanting it to be good, but we're just licking our lips over yet. here. We're just licking our lips, like waiting for the the weather to finally change. Right, teasing but, us. Good, good to see you, and I'm um, stoked to get another episode going after the ones we did at Winter Clash. Episode 158. Everyone, thank you for joining us who's watching live or who's watching this recorded or who's listening on iTunes. I'll give you a quick spiel. Please, if you don't already, follow us on all of our social media platforms. We have a Facebook. We have an Instagram. You could follow. We have a YouTube page. You can subscribe and hit the notification bell. Leave a comment. Share. All really helps. We have an iTunes. If you like what you're listening to, you can give us a five-star rating and a review. And we also have a Patreon. You can be a Patreon for as little as $3 a month. We really appreciate it if you do it. We actually just lost a few Patreons. So if you want to jump back on and uh, support us, we would very much appreciate that. We've been doing this for over five years, and we would like to continue doing it, and it motivates us very much to do so. And some points of the year, get to events. You know, We just did Winter Clash, and that was really cool. And if we can make it to another event and do more things like that this year, that would be awesome. So thank you for listening to my spiel. And uh, awesome. Do we have a WTF of the week? We do. Let me give a quick shout out to these new Patreon supporters. Let me get this out of the way because I swear people are making up names just to watch me make an ass of myself. But thank you for our new Patreon supporters. This week we have Dian Deanna Tan, Freitas, Will Gray, Mark Vanderbo, Roy Turtman, S. Forza, Patrick Desiderio, Tommy DeCharme, Nicholas Moore, and Darren Thompson. Hopefully that wasn't too bad for everybody. If I offended anybody, I am sorry. I do my best whatever I can. But we do have a WTF this week brought to us by a Patreon supporter, Jonathan Martin, featuring the smooth stylings of Zach Savage with this uh, Top Soul, the 540 True Top Porn Transfer, which is not only is it a crazy trick, but just the way it's done is so sick. The way his legs twist when he spins into the, the True Top Porn is so yeah. sick and it's perfect. Yeah. I love it. There's not like uh, many people that have it, but I think he has my favorite 540 True Top Horn. <laughs> yeah, the the, the 540 True Top Horns, or even like the full cap True Top Horn, is the way that your feet have to be. Just mm -hmm. make the spin uh, look that much cooler. And he locked it, right? When he, I think that's pretty fair to say. People get some criticism for uh, rolling before the trick. And I think, uh, you know, the criticism in that field is valid, but I don't, I don't see him doing that here. Yeah, that was textbook. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, like people like drift into it or kind of like drop roll into it or yeah. slide. But that's like perfect lock on a square ledge. No, he, 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 he locked right into it. And, and and I know people drift on purpose. I'm not like uh -huh. criticizing that at all. You know, um, 
you know, you got to drift into some things, but, but uh, yeah. that one is a straight lock. Straight lock. Big fan of Zach Savage. Congrats on being this week's WTF. I don't think he's been at WTF this week, but I also want to say for audio listeners, a couple of people have mentioned um, because people listen to this audio only, they don't get to see the WTF. I always now post the WTF on our stories after the episode airs. So if you are listening, check out our stories afterwards. You can see the WTF right episode in March yet. And we need to do our monthly supporter giveaway. So like Billy said at the top of the show, we do uh, at the beginning of every month, a monthly supporter giveaway for everyone on our Patreon. We put everybody in a big pot and we spin the wheel and the winner gets to choose one of whatever they want from our online store. So we got the wheel here. Going to give it a big spin for everybody. And the winner of this month's Patreon supporter is... We're both drummers. We should have a drum roll by now. Oh, shit. Shane Coburn. Awesome. Hell yeah. Nice. Shane. Uh, hell yeah. Thank you for supporting. It's awesome seeing Shane uh, obviously support the show. But other than that, just... Uh, I always see him commenting on like skate videos on YouTube and Instagram, and he follows skating a lot still. So that's pretty cool to see. Shane is the uh, former owner of Mind Game for anybody who doesn't know that. Um, but yeah, thank you, Shane. Congratulations for being this month's winner. Uh, we'll reach out to you to see what you want from our online store, give you some Jump Street goodies. Um, yeah. But is there anything Shane, else? Shane, Shane, Shane is not only staying involved, but he's still actively skating at least uh, mm -hmm. once a week. We were yeah. supposed to skate like a week ago, but then I, I hurt my back. Uh, I, pulled a, I pulled a muscle. And so I just uh, had to reschedule. But Is he still doing yeah, the parkour stuff? I'm sure he's like very in shape and probably like, oh, Billy, you pulled your back. Here's what you could do for that. I don't I don't know if he's doing. I didn't even know he was doing parkour. I know he's doing like. Uh, he was he for was a bit. Doing, I know. He's going to the gym a lot and he was doing CrossFit for a bit. And now he's just. Uh, strengthening and conditioning, you know, mm -hmm. good, good thing to do with this, this age. I didn't know he did parkour. That's cool. I mean, he used to, I don't know if I remember seeing like a long time ago, he had like either Instagram or YouTube, like a channel of him doing parkour. But I mean, time flies. That might've been like a decade ago. I don't know. Yeah. But still well, skating. That's pretty cool. Hell yeah, Shane. When I see kids doing parkour now, I just think of uh, like the kids that are jumping, like from flipping the rooftops. Like, the, yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Those people are like crazy. Know. And then that, you see, that's, that, that's a different beast though. Yeah, like running full speed, front flip over a wall that's like 50 feet in the air, land on like another brick wide wall and like just yeah. run off it. It's, it's fucking insane. But hell yeah. yeah imagine, imagine those people learned how to skate. That'd be crazy. We'd have a lot of deaths. Okay, let's let's go on <laughs> past this. Okay, I'm very excited for our guests. We've actually, they've been back involved with blading for a while now. So I've been wanting to have them on the podcast for quite some time. I've known them for a long time. These are OGs, like they were around from... When I was uh, very early involved in skating in the 90s and 2000s, they were there. Um, stoked to get into this conversation with them. But uh, for those of you who know and for those of you who don't, Mer uh, Mike and Derek French. I almost said Merrick. <laughs> Mike and Derek. <laughs> Combine them into one person. Yeah. <laughs> Merrick. <laughs> Merrick. What's up, guys? How I you like doing? That one. It's awesome, man. We're glad to be here. Super yeah, okay, so, okay, so we're gonna have to uh, because this is we. This might be the first time we're doing four screens in Jump Street podcast. Second history. time, second time. So uh, I'm gonna try to. Uh, I'll ask a question to. Uh, I'll, I'll direct it at one of you guys, and then the other one can answer directly after that. So it goes in order like that because I would like to hear both of your answers, but I'll just direct it at one of you guys first, and then. Uh, it can switch back to the other guy to kind of close it out before it comes back to us, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. Just so we're not talking over each other because it could get right. a little wild. Sweet. Yeah, it's like uh, this is I'm – not, I'm not like a pro at moderating, but I'm going to give it a shot now. <laughs> so uh, like I said in the beginning of the podcast, we've been watching you guys for a long time, for years, well over 20 years. You've been OGs in the Minnesota scene. But I don't think a lot of people know where you guys originally came from, like when you started skating. I, I've always known that in Minnesota and Minneapolis, the skating sh scene is very strong because of the hockey connections and all these things like that. But um, Mike, would you care to start with uh, maybe your introduction to inline skating and then Derek <clears throat> afterward? Sure. So we started skating. We lived in Spokane, Washington. That's where we were born. And there was a... There's a big, a big scene out 
out out there back then. Um, and there's some guys that still do it, like Ron King, uh, Dave Hill, Randy Juarez, uh, just a, Tyson Hawkins, like a big group of people that uh, we saw them skate, but we had already started skating in Minneapolis. Uh, we went back to Spokane to visit, and then we had our skates, and we just met up at a skate park. And, um, you know, how we started was we saw um, some kids that we didn't get along with in the neighborhood that were um, – you know, skating ramps and rails. And we were like, wow, that's actually kind of cool. We were doing organized sports at the time. And we were kind of big uh, for our age, like not fat, but like, you know, we were just big dudes. And yeah, they they would call us jocks when we came by. And uh, it really got to us because we were like, we're not jocks, but <laughs> we were totally jocks. And um, <laughs> we asked them one day if we could just try their skates. And um, this, it's Chris Thormalen. Uh, ben Phillippe and Tyler Stanky, some some really good friends of ours. We've been friends with them now for over 30 years. And, um, yeah, they let us try their skates on. And as much as they hated it, they're like, wow, they're, they're actually okay at this. And then they kind of taught us everything they knew, and then we became best friends. But um, it mainly did start in Minneapolis or Minnesota. And, um, yeah, we're, we're originally from Washington State, though. So Interesting. Uh, Derek, would you like care to add to that, or does that sound about correct? Is he telling the I truth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize that you guys are from Washington. I'm always like so familiar with you guys being from the Minnesota area. Um, right. You guys, you guys grew up with the cold. You're used to it, I guess, at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 forgive, and, and then forgive me for this. saying so. Forgive me for saying so, but uh, I could see what they were <laughs> talking about. Like you guys do look like you play like baseball. Or some other kind of stuff. Like, a, lot, a lot of the Big time, guys. Uh, you know, skaters are, you know, all different ranges of heights and sizes. But um, you guys definitely have, like, the look that you play baseball or do something else. So uh, that's why I was actually kind of wondering with Minnesota and Minneapolis, like the hockey connection, if that was ever a part of uh, your background. Derek, was that, like, ever a part of it or did that, was it completely not involved? Yeah, we, uh, we our parents really – couldn't afford to put us in hockey. We had, uh, we've got an older sister, me and my twin, and then triplets after us. So uh, they had too many kids to be paying, you know, thousands of dollars for us to play hockey. We got into roller hockey a little bit, but uh, that really wasn't our thing. Skateboarding, even, we were doing for a little while. And then as soon as we met our neighbors, I mean, we just, it clicked and we just took off with it. Dan, wow. pe people are lucky that you weren't allowed to play hockey. If you, I wouldn't want to be checked by one of you guys <laughs> <laughs> shoved into the wall. Um, but I, I, I know you guys are saying that you came from like the organized sports generation, I guess, like, you know, baseball, basketball. I don't know exactly which sports, but the transition from that to skating is completely different in the context that, you know, there's no one telling you what to do. Um, is that something that like made you guys click into skating more and you were just like, screw the organized sports aspect of it or, or what? <laughs> Let me, let me field this one, Derek. Okay. <laughs> so uh, our stepdad was working for a baseball team uh, when we lived in Spokane, and then he got a job offer for Wichita, Kansas. And then um, from there, he got a job offer for the St. Paul Saints, which these are all minor league teams. And um, he was working the St. Paul Saints as a general manager um, with Bill Murray being the owner. And um, so we got, we've got kind of a funny background with him. And um, we were around baseball, and then he was also a um, – I think he was part owner of something called the St. Paul Slam, which is like a basketball team. Um, so we were always raised around organized sports. But um, as we got older, we started to kind of rebel from the organized sports thing. I, I think it was more like we had fun while we were doing it, but it started to turn into like a like a kind of – I don't know how you'd say it, but it was just kind of like – it, it, it was a task all the time and it wasn't like you could yeah. be creative. You had to do what was, you know, high percentage shots, stuff like that. Or, you know, you always throw it to first, you know, and it's like, oh, this is, this is garbage. You can't really be creative. So we, um, I think when, when we saw that there was an unorganized sport like skateboarding, we were like, wow, this is sweet, but I don't think either one of us could ride sideways to save our life. And, um, I think we had way too much shoulders going on. And, um, so when we started skating uh, forwards on rollerblades, I was like, yeah, this is it. Makes sense. But Derek, go ahead. 
<laughs> no, that, that that makes perfect sense. It's a, uh, it's it's. I'm I'm wondering actually, did did you have a relationship with? Did you meet Bill Murray early on or? Yeah. Oh shit. That's that's interesting. He's like kind of known as like one of like the coolest guys in like Hollywood to a certain degree. He was like known to like go out to like random parties while he was like at the height of his yeah. fame. And so, mm -hmm. what, what's your relation with Bill Murray? That's pretty interesting. Should I go, Derek? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I uh, know. This one over, um, but uh, so yeah. <laughs> oh, hold on, it's back. Like that. My phone, man. It's my work phone. It's gonna be going nuts. But um, so Bill Murray, uh, I was super excited to meet him. I'd watched all of his movies: Ghostbusters, Scrooge, uh, Groundhog's Day, all these movies. And I mean, I even watched Stripes, and I think that was, you know kind of ahead of where I was at as far as being, you know, 10 or 12 years old. Yeah. And um, so he was going to come over to our house and I was like, this is great. You know, I'm going to draw a picture of Bill Murray and I'm going to have him sign it and I'm going to be rich, you know? <laughs> and um, I stayed up for two days drawing this picture of him. And this is the first time I met him. I, I waited, my mom and my stepdad had this giant party with their coworkers and um, I, you know, waited and I waited and I knew he was there and I finished the picture. I was like, this is perfect. And, um, it was the cover of him on the Scrooge, uh, movie where he's like, you know, I've got a scared face where he's dropping a cigar or whatever. And, um, I, you know, made my way through the party at, you know, at 11 years old, 10 years old, however, however old I was. And I, um, I tugged on his shirt like, Hey, Mr. Murray, can you sign this? You know, it's a picture I drew you and he, the whole party goes silent. And he just looks at the picture and he goes, this shit doesn't look like me. And uh, everybody, everybody starts laughing, you know, and I'm a really sensitive little kid. I'm like, man, screw this dude, you know, and like I, I marched my ass downstairs and was just over it and carried a grudge for like a really long time. But um, he signed it, I think. I mean, it's somewhere in my house, but um, I haven't. Uh, you know, I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't, they're like, he's a comedian. He does this. He makes jokes. I'm like, well, they're not funny, you know? And, uh, <laughs> he ended up being super funny. He's a really cool dude. And his kids were really cool. He has, um, two kids, one's Luke and one's Homer. And, uh, they're both really cool kids. Homer looks just like him. And I, I don't know nowadays, this is a while ago, but, um, I mean, he's a, he's, he was a really awesome dude to meet. And every time he'd come out to the park, he would, um, throw out the first pitch, he would chuck it over the, the entire backboard net that's behind home plate and then over into the parking lot and usually bust a car window or something, you know. He's just hilarious. And, uh, yeah, his brothers were super cool and super funny too, and um, it was a really cool experience. Wow, that's interesting. That's so random. That's a funny background, yeah. I never. I also <laughs> never heard of somebody named Homer before that wasn't part of the Neither have I. <laughs> God That's sick. I hope he. I hope he named his kid after like Homer Simpson. That would be way cool. Um, <laughs> what were you saying, Derek? Uh, we had got one of his kids into rollerblading. We uh, were skating around the stadium and stuff, and um, we found out later that his son had broke his wrist skating, and he wasn't too pleased about that either. So I don't. I, I a terrible experience for them in skating, but it was like in our earlier years. And, we we had told him about it and how how much fun we were having doing it, and then find out that he went off one of these little ramps that you know we were making like you take a block or something and a piece of wood and then he jumped over it and fell back and broke his wrist. Oh. Was that the yeah. end of it? That was the last time he skated. I'm pretty sure. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, yeah. Now, add Bill Murray to the list of people who hate rollerblading. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> I know. We, we could have used them yeah. on our side. <laughs> Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you guys are from like the early days back in the day. Um, I've looked in a, I, you know, I was going through some old things and I remembered the old article, the box magazine class of 2000. Uh, oh, yeah. And that was like a huge thing to be a part of back in the day. For those who don't know, box magazine was the early rollerblading or inline skating magazine around the time of daily bread. Um, I, I would say it was the second largest magazine in, in, in our culture. And they had a release, or it was like the class of 2000. It was 16 people, all of who were supposed to be the future of inline skating. The list was, you know, Frankie Morales, Omar Wysong, uh, Shane Scour, Dominic Sagona, Dre Powell, like, you know, it went on. 
uh, Derek French, Mike French, and everyone who was supposed Ooh. to be like the next big thing. Derek, Derek and, wasn't on there. Oh, Derek wasn't on there. I'm looking at it now. <laughs> Damn! Oh, I, I was on there for both of us. <laughs> okay. It okay. should have said it should have said Merrick French next to your name then. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie's on it too. That's pretty. Yeah. Pretty big names. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that, that's, Mike, Mike Radabaugh, Bashi Pope. There was a lot yeah, of Bashi. a lot of people on that list. Yeah. yeah. So okay, we'll get into that because I know you guys have I, my, my mistake for that. That's my mistake. I should have done that. That's all right. But um, so Mike was. Mike was on the class of 2000 and Derek was on room Raiders. Okay. We're going to get into that, <laughs> but let's get into it with Mike, with the, uh, the, the box magazine class of 2000. Uh, what was that like? And how did you get approached to be in that? Um, so Jeff Erdman, who was, was a really good friend of ours because he was out here in Minnesota with the Gomez brothers and Matt Bandalo. Um, they would always put us in this magazine called skeptic magazine, which was like a local magazine. And then Jeff Erdman um, was the editor at Box, and he he was like, "Hey, I know these guys from you know where I'm from," and he got us some notoriety and was able to get us some publicity. And um, at that point, I was really advancing fast. I mean, I I could I could do things that I didn't even, that surprised myself. But I mean, I was also really comfortable with skating and thinking I was invincible. And um, I tried to do a topside sway out, the spin around soul on this on this rail called um, Minneapolis Community College. And um, John Elliott was there, Ben Weiss was there, a bunch of a bunch of people were, we were filming that day for like, I can't remember which video it was, but um, you know, they were shooting the picture for something for Box Magazine and they got my face picture. And then right after that, I cracked my head wide open. I just got way too oh. comfortable on a topside sway out and hit my heels and went straight back and the way I passed out looked like I died, you know, just kind of rolled down the stairs lifeless. Oh, and um, no. yeah, it was great for video though. It was really good. <laughs> I still got the scar on the back of my head, but um, yeah, man. that was one time that I just realized you got to be really vigilant when you're doing alley topside. So um, I, if you ever watch any of my clips now, you can always tell that I'm grabbing for the rail while I'm doing the trick just in case. And yeah. uh, it kind of sucks because it affects my style, but um, there's trauma behind that. So right. <laughs> Wow, I was. I, I think is the is is the community college rail like the big one down the stairs? Yeah, it was. It would go at an angle, and um, a lot of people. There were like different rails coming down all over. I'm trying yeah. to think of something that you would remember that would be. It's like, yeah, it was all power. over BG10, I think, right? Like a bunch of. Yeah, BG10. it was on BG10 a ton. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's like what Mike I was thinking Redaba too. was skating it and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. familiar with that spot. Yeah. Mm. Um, a crazy trick on that rail. Now. It's a big rail. Yeah, it's fun. So, so that's kind of the thing that got you the the spot in the magazine, like that moment. No, they. Um, I think what happened was is they. Like so, at that time, I had been um, a lot of stuff was coming out. Like um, second to none was a Minnesota video that came out. None was um, being filmed at that time. VG uh, Ten had came out. And there were um, there were some other videos we were working on, and um, like Dave Painted came out, so I, I was able to get my name out there a little bit. And those times, Derek would be skating with me too. But I think people have been so confused by us being twins <laughs> that a lot of times earlier on, they really did think we were the same people, um, unless you were like staying at my mom's house or like hanging out with us individually uh, at the same time. I mean, I don't think people. People to this day still are like, there's two of you. It's like, dude, we've been doing this for 30 years. And yeah. it, like people think I, I, I'm wearing blue and then I go change into red, you know, <laughs> just be, like wherever we go. They're like, oh, shit, there's two of them. It's like, damn, man. That's funny. So, That's funny. Maybe though. this will help our cause. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so curious now. Like what, what <laughs> other – well, so what else was it like growing up with a twin that skated? I know people obviously got you confused. I know – that happened with other people too, but there's not many identical twins. I don't think that skate. So like, right. Was there anything else like that that happened? Like, I know you guys are probably pushing yourselves a lot because you always had somebody to skate with, right? Like, were you in competition with each part. other all the time? That's the best part. Yeah. I mean, we still are nonstop. <laughs> yeah. That's so sick. That's like ideal for most people skating. Like, 
I want to skate all the time, but I don't always have someone to skate with. And like, if, if you had like somebody like your brother, especially growing up, you live with them. It's easy to be like, Hey, let's yeah. go, let's go hit the streets. You know, that's awesome. Yeah. And he's on the floor downstairs right now. And I'm on the floor upstairs <laughs> and we even had a competition of who could come up with a better backdrop. So <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. Mike, I thought you were going to have like the wall, like all organized with all the skates, like, like a sneaker wall type of thing. I wasn't going to move them all, man. I was like, dude, this is a nightmare. They're well, everywhere how, up here. How many pairs of skates do you have for people who don't I'm, know? I'm over a hundred. I don't know like exactly how many, but, um, I've got like 50 USD thrones. I've got like 30, well, 25 custom USD power slide carbons, carbon freeze, and then just a bunch of other random ones. Um, I, I try everything. And it started because two years ago, when I, when I broke my back two years ago or blew out my discs in my back or three years ago now, I had a surgery and I had sold all my skates, so I wasn't tempted to go skating. And um, I, I, when I had this surgery to fix my back, I was like, shit, I think I could skate. The doctor said I could skate. So I started buying some skates online and I'm like, ah, these ones kind of hurt my feet or these ones are a little off or I'm just an addict. So I was like, I'm just going to buy these because I can, you know, so I'd buy a bunch of different pairs of skates. And then, um, yeah, I just kind of developed like this habit of being like oh new skates i'm gonna try them uh, you know i've got like six seven pairs of mesmers but um i changed Damn. i changed those into thresmers so i put throw <laughs> plates on them <laughs> see I, yeah, I think i've seen a couple you did that with the dominics right um let's see here i'll show you the green ones oh yeah i did, I did do it with the bruces yeah sick damn my man's got over 100 pairs of skates that's insane damn the demsmers <laughs> <laughs> and then look at it. wow oh my god that's so funny i actually just got that from um <laughs> long sent me that i just got that in the mail wow damn those are yeah, nice i, that's I actually like the mesmers a lot i um hold on i dropped my headphone <laughs> <laughs> wait oh. to roll, roll at the door <laughs> yeah almost <laughs> derek how many skates do you have Two pairs of razors and a pair of, uh, <laughs> um, what do they call the, uh, carbons? Mike, what do you say? Uh, no, they, um, uh... <laughs> you guys know what he's I writing. Know, I, take, I take them all from Mike, but, uh, I've, I've got razors on my newest and, uh, I got a, what oh is that? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Look at oh my god. The, there we go. That's perfect. Oh we made my it for god. the podcast. <laughs> That's What's going so good. What's going on in the top corner of the shirt? The Air Jordan logo. Oh, it's it's that's our abstract logo. That's the uh, oh. other side, Mike. On this side. Man, how do I fix this damn thing? This camera's got me backwards, bro. Yeah. But yeah, that's our abstract logo. It's just um so I don't know. It's just something that we've been doing. We, uh, I got, I really wanted to start making clothes um, a while ago. Just, just something fun to do. I mean, I do art, a ton of art, and I thought um, when when I wanted to get into tattoos, I decided to. I didn't want to do tattoos because what if you screw up on somebody's body? That's for life, you know. And um, then I started to like make my own clothes, and uh, I, I had Randy Juarez from um, and his his wife make like um some vinyl heat press stuff for me and i i bought a heat press at an arts and crafts show that my mom was working at and uh i was like dude this is this is the funnest stuff i've ever done so i just started making a ton of clothes and i've had a blast doing it because you can kind of combine your art with fashion and that's fun as hell for me so i've never i've never been more inspired to be creative than um you know the last couple of years when i started doing my painting and you know making clothes and it, it, it's just like skating it's like you can express yourself any way you want and i mean i mean i made a shirt for a guy the other day that uh he asked me it's a really good friend of mine in recovery he said um hey will you make me a shirt and he, i said what is it what do you want it to say he said um it's better to it's better to shit in your sink than sink in your shit and i was like that's <laughs> awesome so <laughs> that's a good one it's just that fun. is a good, a good one. one it's, just, it's cool it's a good saying yeah. <laughs> Both are, so, if yeah, you can avoid um, both, so that's good. Uh, Sorry. Like, uh, I have two pairs of gods and two pairs of razors. I see, <laughs> I see Richard in the comments. He came in with the, 
letting everyone know that you had gods. Did you see that too? <laughs> you got to remind them. <laughs> wow. So, you, so one has 30 skates, the other has four. That's, that's interesting. So you guys are different. A uh, hundred. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you guys, you got, you guys are, are twins. You look alike. You're, you're both interested in skating, but you obviously have your own different styles and tastes and approaches to things uh, that, that make you yourselves. Um, I was going through your history and your original sponsors and obviously Revolution being a part of that. What Heck made yeah. you guys make the move to go to Arizona? Um, so after I graduated high school, I wanted to um, skate, you know, 365 days a year. And, you know, when we you get this seasonal depression when you live in Minnesota and it snows, like, like you were talking about, Billy, how yeah. it's – all of a sudden winter's over, but spring is here. And then you get dumped on by like 10 feet of snow. And <laughs> um, what's crazy is this year, we didn't have any snow all winter. And then all of a sudden they're like, it's officially spring. And mother nature's like, no, it's not. And just dumped no, on funny. us. So, <laughs> yeah. And um, so, so I moved, to, I want, originally wanted to move away from this and go skate, you know, all year long. And um, my dad had lived in Arizona at the time. And uh, I was talking with JB Snyder and he said, he was going to make the move to Arizona. So I just packed up my car and dipped and um, I moved out there and I, I mean, it was a wonderland. I moved out there and right before winter and I was like, this is absolutely insane how nice it is. And everybody's like wearing sweatshirts, calling them jackets and, you know, freezing their ass off when it's 60 degrees and I'm in shorts trying to find a swimming pool. Like it yeah. was amazing. And, um, then the summer hit and I was like, oh my God, this is ridiculous. So um, I stayed there for 12 years. Derek moved uh, shortly after that. He moved from Wisconsin to come live with me. And we started kind of a party house with JB and Billy Lanham and uh, just a wild times. Dan O'Connor, like from these, JB and Dan are from uh, the Sendocon days. I don't know if you remember those days. Oh yeah. But um, yeah. hell yeah. So really cool crew guys. And um you know, people would come out and then also Dustin Latimer was out there and uh, Seth Miner, me and Seth Miner didn't get along back then, but uh, we've grown to be pretty good friends these days. He's a really good dude. And, um, you know, I think we were too much alike and um, there was a lot of headbutting going on. And um, yeah, Derek moved out and then we just, I mean, the rest is history. We, we were out there for 12 long years and traveling to Cali and back and forth. I mean, some of the best years of our lives, but also some of the worst years of our lives just because of going down the wrong path started there in Arizona. And um, yeah, it was, it, it was just the parties, you know? I mean, Billy, you had seen it before. You had seen like the, we were renting a giant house, always throwing parties and it was just complete debauchery and it was mayhem. And we thought that was, we've made it, you know? And had no idea what it was like to even try and be an adult, I guess you'd say. And uh, nowadays, I mean, we both had kids out there within 13 days and 30 minutes of each other um and uh like twin cousins damn near and um both of the girls work together at a restaurant and uh <laughs> yeah hooters so, so but, just um, wow that, that that's that's oh, sorry that that sounds like so you go out there you go out for skating you end up going down with some blader guys you get a big party house and they're skating and partying but for what it sounds like maybe like the partying kind of goes more than the skating at some point and Absolutely. um you ended up finding before or after at some point a uh, couple girls who worked close together you had kids within 13 <laughs> days of each other yeah. um what were you doing out there for work uh to sustain so, this lifestyle so this is kind of i mean this is a perfect segue into what lifestyle i mean what what brought us to the dark side of the lifestyle so <clears throat> Because we were both salesmen, um, I mean, we had a lot of odd jobs. So Derek would do like, I remember he was epoxy flooring for a while. And I was always working at a telemarketing place. It was always some sort of telemarketing because I talk a lot. And uh, <laughs> Derek just sits back and waits and he just preys on me talking too much. And um, <laughs> but, but if there were good jobs, Derek would come work with me because he still has the gift of gab as well. But um so we would work somewhere for like six months gather up some money uh and then you know be able to pay rent and do all the things we wanted to do but then we'd go on like a skate tour or a trip somewhere skating and then lose your job because you were gone for too long or came back with a 
broken foot or, you know, like broken ribs or sitting on one of those round soft pillows because you broke your tailbone, you know, and uh, they'd be like, you know what, just get out of here. And um, so we ended up uh, always coming back to get different jobs. And we had really good jobs. We some I, w- I worked at Monster.com with Derek for a while for like six months. They thought we were the same person, the <laughs> owner or the the um, what was he like a regional manager or the vice president comes in and he goes, you know, I just found out today there's two of you. I'm like, damn, you sign our paycheck every week. And uh, you thought we just changed clothes, you know? And he's like, yeah, I thought it was really weird, but I'd see you in different outfits. I just thought you really cared about fashion. And I just, I was like, man, this is causing an identity crisis. And um, yeah. <laughs> so we ended up, uh, we ended up doing what a lot of people that we saw through like media and our culture um, were doing, which was like selling drugs. And I mean, it's as awful as that sounds at the time, we'd have to keep it hidden. So we'd have to leave, we'd have to live like this double life, you know? And I remember seeing people come into town that would be like, Oh, what's the first thing they ask for when they come to town? They'd be like, Oh, can you guys find any weed? I mean, these are the best pros in the world coming to town being like, you know where I can find something. So we'd always have it or be able to get it or, and, and that, you know, that was more the more innocent side of things. Um, and then it turned into when people started getting drunk, they're like, "Whoa, you know what we can." He he talked his headphones out of his ears. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so so yeah. Anyways, long story short, we ended up selling drugs, which led to a life of partying rather than skating, um, because we couldn't find decent jobs to keep us um, you know, that, that we could keep and continue to skate and. Um, Eventually, what happens is the slow erosion of what you actually love, and it takes over everything that – I mean, it took everything I love from me because um, I'd always have to continue to find the next drug or the next amount of money, and um, it led to a pretty dark place. So um, I'm really happy to be back from that, you know, and it's something that not a lot of people come back from. It's a really low percentage, so – it was good to hear that you guys got back from that and like you seem to be both doing really well now. What was like the path out of there? Like what motivated you to get out of that and how has like your life changed since then? Go ahead, Derek. Well, um, so the, for the last five years since, uh, uh, June 6th, 2018, actually six years is when I decided to go to treatment and, um, that was actually because my the mother of my children was like if you don't go to treatment you know i'm leaving you and taking the kids and so i went into treatment i didn't even know it was an option because i didn't think i had a problem and when i finally went into treatment i started learning all these things that are related to the behaviors how you know just the partying lifestyle of rollerblading it turned into you know it was like partying rollerblading and then you know the rollerblading went down the partying went up and pretty soon the party was over and it was just drugs it was just an addiction alcohol and drugs so um life became unmanageable i went into treatment and you know 10 months into it i'm trying to talk mike into coming into treatment because i care i cared about him and you know you don't realize how the dangers of any of it until you start getting sober and then you start worrying about the people you love. And so I was trying to get Mike to come into treatment because he, it was hard to get him to even come visit me. It was like holy water to a vampire. You know, he'd be like, "Eh, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of busy. Then he'd come in and visit me for like five minutes when I had visitation and be like, here's 15 bucks. I got to go. And then after 11 months, I get out and, uh, I find out Mike get, got arrested and was looking at eight to 12 years in prison. And so I knew it was some serious charges and I had been begging him to come into treatment before something like this happened. And <clears throat> I mean, it was, it was difficult. It, it affected my recovery. First of, first of all, like, you know, worrying constantly about my brother and having to visit him in prison or, you know, there goes the skating, there goes, the family life, you know, everything that I was trying to get back felt like it was just taken from me. And so um, it actually, things started to work out. You know, the prayers were working and uh, doing God's will, Mike was able to transfer from Wisconsin where you don't get out of anything. 
you can't get out of trouble in Wisconsin. They no don't, tolerance. Yeah, so uh, they went, he went from looking at 8 to 12 years in prison to transferring his case over to Minnesota. And I think just, you know, narrowly escaped with uh, house arrest. So it was like... Well, well yeah. hold on, hold on now. <laughs> so okay, hold on, hold on, wait, wait. I, I, I just want to, because I want to hear this side, but I also want to uh, just make sure we're all up to speed. Uh, eight, eight to ten years is a is a long time. Do, do you mind yeah. if I ask what the what the charges were? Sure. So, um, at the time, I was living in like squalor, you know, with just complete. And I don't want to say anything bad about an addict, um, but I would say it was some good people making really bad decisions. And um, we lived right by a casino, and these people wanted drugs and said if I would go get drugs and sell these drugs to this person, that it would pay my rent. And um, I was like, of course, you know, that's more money for me if I don't have to pay in cash. And um, then I met the person they wanted me to sell to, and I was like, no way. You know, I just got a bad feeling. And they kept trying this. You know, I said I'd rather pay cash, and I, I did this two or three times. And, um, you know, they wanted me to get methamphetamines for somebody that looked like a cop. And um, anyways, long story short, I ended up getting to a, um, well, as an addict, you get, you have less and less, you have less and less choices, the narrow, more narrow your path goes. And um, I got to the point where, you know, I was out of gas, I was stuck somewhere and um, I had somebody who could drop it off and, you know, this guy could come pick it up and it would pay for the rent and pay for the car and the gas and all this stuff that I had to deal with. And, um, instead of the guy showing up, I, I mean, I ran out of gas and I just started fishing, trying to figure something out, you know? And like I said, I was an addict in the depth of my addiction. And, um, I got, uh, instead of the guy showing up that I finally agreed to have him come meet up, um, they had a decoy cop, um, uh, down at the end of this long dirt road, kind of distract my attention. And I looked down there and I was like, oh, shit, that's a cop. And then I didn't realize it, but task force who came up behind me and snuck up on me and said, hands in the air, freeze, you know. And I was like, this isn't about my fishing license, is it? You know, and next mm -hmm. thing you know, they're like, no. And they're like, you know how this works, you know, turn everybody in. And I was like, just take me to my bunk. I have a problem, you know. And they took everything and, you know, I had nothing. They searched the house that I was in. I found out I got ratted on by the, the people I lived with so they can avoid charges. And, um you know, that was a really dark time, but um, when, I, when it happened, I felt really free from everything. You know, I felt like, holy shit, maybe this is the chance that I can do what my brother did and start working on myself, you know? And you you don't imagine that you, like, you have any anything left in life when you get that low. Um, you've let go everything that you love, and you've traded it in for this life of just following to the next quest or the next bs thing to get your fix and um i was i was at the bottom of my barrel and uh when i went to jail i remember i just went straight to sleep and i woke up and i just kept praying and things kept getting worse and um i knew from the moment that i got locked up that it wasn't going to be an easy road and um you know i went from a minimum security uh county jail cell with like 30 other people in jail or 30 other um, I don't want to call them prisoners, but you know what I mean? J jail mates, I guess. And in like a bunk dormitory type of situation. And then, um, you know, my ego and everything else and all the feelings mixed into it. I, I got into fights and I ended up in from medium and then max and then seg where they put you in a room and take away your mattress. And you're just in a cold room by yourself for, you know, I don't know, 18 hours with no, nowhere to lay down or anything. And uh, going through all that, I think that, it was, it was just harsh enough to make me realize that um, this is something I never want to go through again. And that's the moment I decided I wanted to take this time and like utilize it as best as I could so that I wouldn't go back down that path. So I joined like an NA group. I joined a Bible study group. Um, I started drawing to survive in there. Um, I, I, I just want to tell you guys a story. I know this will take a long time and I talk a lot, but. No, it's good. Would, it's a, we're here okay. to talk and listen. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I, I, I could always draw. I wasn't like the best at it, but when I started doing drugs, you know, my drawing kind of went downhill just like my skating because you just think you're doing a lot, but it's just garbage. And um, when I got sober, I realized that my drawing skills had come back 
And so to, to survive in there, to get like Snickers or ramen noodles, I would draw pictures of people's loved ones so they could put them up on the wall, you know? And um, so I was making a killing in there, I thought, you know, over ramen noodles and stuff a day. And um, then they put me into like this cell that I couldn't get out of. It was called SAG. And every 30 minutes, um, a CL would come in, you know, and I was in there for six months. And when they would come in, they were just ruthless, you know. They're like just mean people, you know. I mean, they, I mean, the job would suck. You're sitting around people that you're like holding captive against their own will, and they they don't like you, you know. But I would try and like be friends with them, like, hey, how's it going, you know? Hey, just uh, want somebody to talk to, you know. <laughs> and then uh, I started drawing pictures of them when they would when they would walk by and look at them real close, and then I would draw a picture of them. And uh, I drew a picture of one of them and I stuck it up on the window so they could see it and. Um, this dude was like, that was, that's me. That was, that's really good. You know? And then, um, there was this guy who was a really big jerk and I had a, a, a tooth that was getting fucked up because a cavity filling fell out from the garbage ass food. They give you the bread being too hard, cracked my crown. And, um, I was like, Hey man, I need some ibuprofen or some Advil. He's like, no, I can't give it to you. You know? And I was just like, you can, I'm dying. I need it. You know? And they're like, you need to talk to the nurse on Monday. And so all weekend I was suffering through this, but every med pass I asked him if I could have Tylenol and Advil. Anyways, he just kept telling me like, there's nothing he could do. And so when he walked by one time, I drew this like really funny picture of him. It was like a character, you know, but I like accentuated like his really weird, like, um, look, you know, he looked like, like lurch with really long arms and, um, you know, like a really big bottom lip. And, um, he was super, he was bald and he was just not happy about it when that, so I put it up on the thing when his buddy walked by and he goes, Holy shit. He goes, get that down, man. You don't want him to see that. Have you seen the size of his hands? And I'm like, at this point, I don't care. What's he going to do? Put me in jail. You know? And, um, it was funny because then they flipped my bunk. They, they made everybody go into a different room and they, they searched my, just my room. And I just see all these guards in there laughing about all the pictures I've drawn of them and stuff. And I just realized, like, you know, when I get out of here, that's what I'm going to do with my life is I'm going to start drawing. And that was, like, the only ambition I had, you know. And um, so that got me through those six months, that and NA and the Bible group. And, uh, yeah, Derek said, hey, why don't you go to treatment right when you get out? And I was like, perfect, that's what I need. I'm going to be in jail forever, and then I'm going to go to treatment after that. Like, I feel like a caged bird at this point. And then – um I went to treatment and uh, it was the best decision I ever made. I, I've stayed sober for just under five years and, um, you know, I do a lot of artwork. I unfortunately not as much as I want to because I have a career now that, you know, I, I have a life that I couldn't have pictured six years ago. Um, if you asked me to envision like the most perfect life, I couldn't have imagined this any better. And, um, you know, every day I'm grateful and I still have a lot of challenges because, you know, depression is real. The feeling of like, um, not being good enough or not being where other people are at at my age, you know, because of all the setbacks that I put myself through um, and trying not to be a victim and feeling like I, you know, yeah, I know I did this to myself and I know that um, this path is a lot harder because I've had to be comfortable with being uncomfortable for the past five years because I can't numb all my feelings and um, where I'm at now is starting to bear all the fruits from it. And, um, it's great. I mean, my brother's got over a year sober now, and um, we both work for a company that we're doing something good for people. We um, we do storm restoration, and we kind of – I don't want to say we fight insurance companies, but let's say we hold them accountable um, because they're not in the business of paying people um, Right to get their stuff done. So I don't want to keep going too far. I'll just talk for two hours. No, so. no, no. Like, first of all, thank you for sharing that. That's like a huge Absolutely. thing. And I, I know we have, the, there's in our culture and in the community, just like many others, there's like addiction problems and people like, sure. you know, looking to escape things and maybe in unhealthy ways. So it's, it's good to like tell these stories and have people hear them and know where they can begin to like find the tools or what, what works for you. Yeah. So I think that's, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I want, I wanted to talk on to touch with Derek. Wait, 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 real wait, quick. wait, 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 one second, one second. Real okay. Quick. The last thing I forgot to add right. is that um, when they let me out of jail, because I went to treatment and then um, I was able to get the case transferred to Minnesota so that I was able to um, go on house arrest with work release because they ordered uh, jail for six months and then they ordered um, five years of probation. So just almost done with the probation this time next year, I'll be done. Uh, but I was able to 
have 12 years hang over my head rather than have um, 12 years in prison. So yeah, uh, I know you had asked about that, but go ahead. Yeah. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. Don't be sorry. Like, and thank you for sharing. Like, I'm sure that was yeah. like a huge motivator in, uh, along with many other things in, in keeping you on the sober path, like how yeah. you're not hanging over your head and being able to get past that. Um, Derek, so, so you mentioned uh, where we left off that you were in, uh, you got yourself into treatment, you were trying to get Mike into treatment, uh, and then and then you heard about his arrest. I'm, I'm assuming both of you guys was maybe drugs and alcohol or different things or similar drugs of choice, uh, but but something along that, that line. But um, what what was your reaction uh, when you heard Mike had gotten arrested and you were like so far away from where he was and, and everything? Man, that was uh, that was like one of our biggest fears. First, as an addict, and you know, uh, being brothers and being so close. You know, like we've grown up together. We started rollerblading together. You know, we we fought with people together. Like nobody had eyes in the back of their heads. So I mean. Everywhere we went, we were fucking Batman and Robin, you know? And, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, not going to ask who was who. To, right. <laughs> well, you know, I naturally, I just, I'll step down and let Mike be, be the, uh, have the main role. But um, a lot of the times, um, we want, our biggest fear was jail or prison, you know? We're like, that's what a lot of addicts fear. You don't want to have consequences for your actions, you know? And, when he got locked up, it was, it was like earth shattering for me. Like it broke my heart, you know, like being like, I might not see my brother for a long time. And I mean, I was working like double time trying to make sure that I could support my kids and, you know, my, my girl at the time and be able to put money on his books. Cause Mike wasn't making it easy for me. He was like, man, I don't know how long I'm going to be in here for put money on my books, man. This is miserable. And, Come man, on, man. I mean, yeah, I'm running out of phone time. So, you know, these were <laughs> these were my responsibilities at this point. It was it was a lot. It was a lot to try and uh, you know, like sustain my recovery. And so I actually relapsed not just from that, but like from all of the factors that were weighing on me. I I relapsed and that was after, you know, 11 months of treatment. I didn't make it to a year and that, you know, that was where I wanted, that was, it was such an important milestone for me. And I put it up on this pedestal. Like I just can't wait to get to my one year. And at the time, you know, my, the mother of my children, she made it to a year before me because she went into treatment before me and was demanding that I went into treatment. And then, you know, right before I hit my year, this is when all this happened. And, you know, it just, it, it took a lot out of me and, I actually was in treatment for 29 out of 36 months trying to get it right. And so then my last, my last attempt um, was about three years ago I, when I was in treatment, I had eight months sober. I was, I had, I've learned, I had learned everything I needed to learn in treatment. There was no more. They're like, okay, we're, we're going to graduate you early because this was like a refresher course for me. I was just trying to get anything that I had missed the times before and me and Mike and a couple of our homies, um, Matt Hadakowitz, Nelson Wong, all these guys that uh, we rollerblade with, we went to our local skate park, Third Layer, and um, I was actually expecting my son, uh, Jordan. He's, uh, he's almost three now, but uh, I had just come up with this eight-month plan because I found out a month earlier that um, my, my ex was pregnant and we were about to have a kid. So I came up with this eight-month plan with my therapist on what I'm going to do to make sure that I had, it, had everything I could have prepared to have my son. And I, we went skating and I broke my leg. Like I was doing an alley fish brain on the ball. I just waxed it a little too much. And I think I had tried this alley fish brain like 30 times just trying to get it right. And back then, I thought I was still invincible. I hadn't had an injury this bad in rollerblading to, uh, to date. And so I, was, I, th I seriously think I took like 30 attempts at this alley of fish brain, and then finally I waxed it, did the whole side of this hip, and then I couldn't get off the alley of fish brain. And I, like, I stuck, but I jumped off, and I landed like flat bottom, and my skate was a little sideways. And next thing you know, my whole 
my leg snapped tibia and fibia broken half my leg was facing the other direction and then it was like you know eight months sober went i like i was in the ambulance and he's like uh i, I told him because they, they they tell you to practice this when you get injured or when you go to the hospital like let them know you're in recovery and i'm in the ambulance with a broken leg my my leg felt like it was sitting like this on the stretcher and he i was like i'm in recovery and he goes well this is fentanyl and he shot it into my leg <laughs> after that i'm hitting the buzzer every 30 minutes you know because i'm in pain and right it was off off to the races man my addictions were fired up once again and you know i they, people were telling me you know it's you can still count yourself as sober and in recovery, even though you're, you know, forcibly taking Percocets twice a day, three times a day. I threw, I, feel, I felt like I threw away my clean time once again. And so that's why, even though I've been trying since June 6th of 2018, that's why I have like 14 months sober right now. It's breaking my leg. And that was the worst injury to have to come back from. I mean, I've, I had a car accident February 8th, 2006 drinking and driving that's when we rode for revolution we were making a couple videos back then uh tricks was made by a guy uh david paul right david right mike david paul yeah david paul uh, we were filming for a bunch of videos with uh john jenkins x-rated and um i had crashed my car um and i shattered my face i got a plate and six screws right here they had mike stand in the operating room so they could put my chin back together with reconstructive surgery and um, I had the emergency brake. It was bent around like this going in my knee. And so I got like baseball stitching on this kneecap. And then I had the frame of the car going into my left leg, like right here. So oh, I got a big, big scar here. And then, you know, 40, over 40 staples in my legs from that car accident. And that was, you know, almost 20 years ago. And then this broken leg, I'm, didn't think I'd be able to make another comeback into rollerblading. I mean, this is like my fourth comeback into rollerblading. And, wow. Uh, yeah, Mike made it. I just got to say something. I just got to say something. The the look on both of our faces when he broke his leg was like, oh! No! Like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. It was terrible. But, uh, yeah, the car accident thing it. was terrible, too. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, I heard about the car accident. I remember talking to you guys about it. I didn't know it was that bad. Um, yeah. And I just want to say, like, congrats on 14 months sober because you hit your year that you've been wanting to hit. And, you know, that's that's not easy. You know, uh, one month, you know, three months, six months, one year, those are all, like, huge landmarks in uh, sobriety. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think everyone in our community, if they, they've lived long enough or are old enough, uh, have have met someone who's had these struggles or in the family, you know, or it's just like, this is the point we're at in, in the world where I think everyone knows someone who has, has had these experiences. So just huge yeah. congratulations for getting mm -hmm. to that. And I can't imagine, you know, I, that, that, that's a, you're, you know, you as an addict to have that kind of injury and then to even like be able to verbalize in that moment that, Hey, I'm an addict which most people would probably throw out of the window at that point anyway, because they're like, holy shit, I'm suffering. I'm in all this pain. Yeah. And then to kind of against your will get like uh, stuck with fentanyl is, you know, that's, that's tough, man. But like here you guys stand like, you know, years later, you're both skating again. You've made full comebacks. You both look fantastic. You both look healthy. And yeah. you know, you have this, all these uh, months and years uh, respectively under your belt. So I just think that's, that's just like, Awesome. So I want to get into uh, the, the sobriety as well, but I want to get into like sk what skating was for you in terms of like making that comeback and having that be something in there as a tool that you could use to like as a positive force that's been there with you, like from like your early days since you were young, something that's always been good, even though it led into bad things with partying and all these other things. What was uh, inline skating or rollerblading for you during your recovery? Respectively, of course. Rollerblading is like, I mean, for all of us, it's its a passion. It's its a way that we can express ourselves. And um, it's its 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 our way of, you know, it's our release. I, I can, I mean, I guess I can only speak to myself, but I mean, it's it was my life for so many decades. And, you know, 
drugs took that from me or I just threw it away because of drugs. You know, the revolution days, I mean, I was burning bridges at that point. I was throwing a lot of my um, close personal relationships with people. I, I burned a lot of bridges because of my addictions, but rollerblading to me was, it was everything. It was, it was a community of people that it allowed us to have friends across the world. You know, like when we had that episode of Room Raiders, it could have been the most embarrassing thing in the world that for anybody, because I don't know if, if anybody who's ever watched Room Raiders, it's like, if I ever met that dude in person, I would whoop his ass. You know, like I, I know there's other people out there that feel like me when they watch that show. Like, and we, we became those people. And it was like, damn, we like a lot of, okay. So a lot of people on BMAG used to talk shit. Right. And when we got in, when I got into my car accident, people were like, um, you know, why are we doing a fundraiser for Derek? He was drinking and driving, you know, and I, I, I'm guilty, you know, like I, I made a mistake and I, I, I wish I hadn't, I wish I didn't have a drinking problem, but, um, I got out of my, you know, the, the hospital to Mike telling me, look at this BMAG message board. All these people are talking shit about <laughs> it. So I'm like, okay, you know, like, I got to today. Yeah. So, I mean, it, I, I learned a lot of my behaviors and a lot of the problems were so much deeper than the drug, you know, like yeah, I had to modify a lot of behaviors and I learned that through treatment, but, um, rollerblading for me, like has been, since getting out of treatment, it's been something that I can do to make me, it makes me feel young again. It, it's nostalgic. It takes me back to a time where life was so much simpler, you know, and, you know, it, it would, I never did it for the money because I never made any money off rollerblading. And there aren't a lot of people <laughs> who do, but um, it just, it reminds me of simpler times where, you know, I'm not worried about all the big pressures of life and, you know, and having five children and now I got my kids rollerblading with me. It feels amazing. You know, like my, my eight year old son, Joshua loves it. And he has that same passion where when I tell him it's time to go, they're shutting the lights off in the skate park and he's still skating. You know, it's, it's awesome. One more, and one more, one more time. Just like Ben Weiss. Mm. But yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Mike, what do you think about it? Mike, what do you think? Yeah, that was from our room leaders, dude. But I don't know, Derek, what do you think? Um, <laughs> so, like, rollerblading for me, when I was a kid, I mean, I knew it wasn't basketball or any of that stuff. I knew it wasn't school because I failed almost everything and I couldn't pay attention. I had, like, the ultimate case of ADHD, and obviously. And, um, you know, I they kept giving me Adderall when I was a kid. And it really kind of messed me up. It made me think that there's always a drug you can take or a pill you can take that can change your mood or fix you, right? And it's kind of like the setup that we have for a lot of kids in America. Instead of being like, oh, you have energy that needs to go towards something creative that keeps your attention rather than sitting here learning this indoctrinated BS. I don't even want to get into that. Uh, that's for some other time. But um, I really felt like there was no escape from all that for me, you know? And... Um, I aced every art class. I gym class aced it every time, you know, but uh, the the hardest part for me was paying attention to stuff that I didn't want to pay attention to. So when, um, when skating came into my view, it was like, this is all I wanted, you know, and I will never forget my first competition. Um, it was at third layer. Well, my first competition I won was at third layer and I, I obsessed over it. I came up with a line in my head and I was going to compete against like John Stoll, um, Shane McClay, Steve Thomas, like all these big names, John Robinson, all these guys before, like even before the, I think this was before the Jeff Howard and Chris Farmer days, um, cause that's all kind of a blur still, but um, I know they were skating. They just weren't a big name yet, obviously, because um, we hadn't even, I mean, this was still the era before us, um, mm -hmm. but I had done my line in my head 400 times uh, every hour on the hour. You know what I mean? I'm like, da, 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 da. And, and I didn't sleep the night before the competition. And then I went there and I laced every trick. And I was like, there's a future in this for me. And I'm going to be the best rollerblader in the world. And um, 
at the time, you know, that was all that mattered. So I, I basically took my entire identity and wrapped it into just being a rollerblader. I didn't do any personal development. I wasn't like, you know, working out. I wasn't stretching. I was just, what do rollerbladers do? That's what I'm going to do. What do the best rollerbladers do? That's what I'm going to do. And um, unfortunately, it's like a huge facade back then. Um, I mean, the videos would come out and you would just see the way they wanted their rollerblader to be portrayed, you know, and then when you meet them, you're like, oh, he's nothing like that, you know, and, um, you know, I had some disappointing encounters, but I had some really amazing encounters, like um, some really amazing people I met when I was young. And, um, you know, rollerblading became, it was just it for me. And, uh, you know, without that personal development, I feel like it kind of, once I, the drugs and alcohol took effect and I started drinking at like 15, um, it stunted my mental growth and my, like my emotional development. And um, so then I just became this like, I don't know. I, I felt like a failure. I felt like an imposter. I was kind of like, you know, I knew I wasn't as good as all these really amazing people. So I knew my future wasn't going to be that great in rollerblading. And it's uh, as an addict, like um, that inner voice can sometimes be a liar. So it's like, you're not good enough. You're not going to be good enough, you know, find something else. And then um, I just would beat myself up to the point where I was constantly trying to prove to myself that I was good enough. And then once the drugs and alcohol completely took effect, it was just, um, it, it, rollerblading was still in the back of my mind. Like even while I was in jail, um, they had me on like a, a second tier, uh, where my cell was at and I'd have to walk down for breakfast, lunch and dinner, you know, past this amazing handrail. And I'm in the whole orange jumpsuit with the orange slippers. And I'm like, man, uh, what I would do on this rail, you know, and it's all like, shut up, you know, you're 30. And I tell other people there, you know, they're like, dude, you're 35 or however old I was, 35 years old, you, you can't roll it. Like, oh, roll it, like, want to know the gayest thing about, or want to know the, what was the joke? Fucking, uh, want to know the hardest thing about rollerblading? It's telling your parents you're gay. And then they all laugh. And it's like, man, you know, I, I, I just, you couldn't take the love I had for rollerblading away, no matter what, what else you took from me. And I would draw pictures of me rollerblading while I was in jail to get by. I would, you know, and, and then when I was in treatment, I started working out. I started on the self-development path and um, I started feeling really good. I started doing yoga and my body started feeling better. And then my brother's like, Hey man, uh, I want a best trick competition. I was like, get the fuck out of here. I was like, you fat ass, you know, weird shit. And um, he showed me this trophy or whatever. And I was like, damn, you really did. And I was like, damn, we, I don't we should skate, you know? So Derek and um, this guy Nelson got me a pair of skates and uh, I was in treatment. I was like, this is great. Like I get a pass. Let's go skate. So we went to third layer and we were skating, and I mean, we were, we, I mean, I was out of shape, I was overweight, and I was just like, dude, this is, this is how I'm going to get rid of that weight, but there was something to be said about the way, it t maybe time travel back to the days of when I wasn't a screw up yet, you know, my life wasn't over, like, it was what I've been telling myself recently, like, you'll never be able to get a job, you'll never be able to have a career, like, your, your, you know, your record's tainted, like, all this stuff, you know, and, um, once I started skating again, I was like, man, this is the best way to get rid of all this negative feedback from myself. And, um, you know, I didn't even think of it like, hey, we'll be good again one day. Like, it was just kind of like, hey, I'm going to not be so fat soon. And um, and the next thing you know, it was like we were going a lot. And then when Derek broke his leg, it was on such an easy trick. And it was like such, such like a ah, what the fuck moment, you know, that um, – we started talking after that. I said, I'm never skating again, you know, never again. I mean, I had headphones in, but we have like this twin ESP thing. And when that happened, like I turned around, like something's not right. You know what I mean? Like I, I didn't hear it scream at first, but when I looked down and I'm like, what the fuck's wrong? Before I could even hear him say anything, I took my headphone out and he's like, oh my God, my leg. You know? <laughs> I turned around and I looked at my brother's leg. It's completely backwards. Like the guy in Hope's three. And I just, Instantly felt like I was going to vomit, but then you go into like that. We got to get my brother out of here because nobody else is going to take care of my brother. So I got him out. I got him on a stretcher. He had tears and all that stuff, and it was just like my poor brother. You know, it was like, oh my god. And uh, I just remember talking to my mom that night. And I'm like, well, Derek's never going to be able to skate again. And uh, I told myself I'd never skate again. And then um, a month later, it was 50 degrees outside. I was on ankle uh, ankle monitor at that time. I was uh, finally on my house arrest because my cases had settled. And um, I was looking at the one pair of skates that I had in my um, – I had, like, four pairs of skates. But I was looking at one of them, and I'm like, it's 50 degrees out. They said I can go within 200 feet of the building. There's a, um, 
there's a bank to a fence that's right comes off of an exit ramp for the highway and went right in front of the building that I was living in, which was like my sober living. And uh, so I skated down the street as fast as I could. I had my, my camera set up on this light pole and I just did a wall right on the fence and 270 in. And um, on the first try, I hit my heels where the curb and the concrete met and I landed on my left butt cheek weird and felt this weird thing in my back. Like it was just super, all I can explain it as is weird. It felt like, you know, and two of my discs. And um, I just got up, I skated back to the top of the street and I was like, I'm going to land this while I still have a little bit of adrenaline. And I, I did it and I landed it. And then I grabbed my video camera and I went back inside and took my skates off. And when I took my skates off, I couldn't get back up. You know, I couldn't go straight back up. And uh, I didn't call an ambulance and found out it was, I blew out my L5 S1 disc right into my sciatic nerve. So like my whole left leg went numb, my right leg went numb. I felt I couldn't feel anything. And then I went into the hospital and told them, Hey, I'm an addict. I, I don't want any pain meds. And they're like, okay, get up and get up and walk over there to the corner, you know, and, and show us that you can get up and walk fine. We won't give you any pain pills, you know, cause you've got to be able to at least walk with some comfort, you know, and I got up and I was instantly, my legs went numb, you know, and they were just like, okay, we're going to give you a very low amount of painkillers. So they give me one five milligram Percocet. I felt like I'd done something wrong. I was, you know, I was really torn about it. So I didn't take any painkillers or do anything for it for a year. I was afraid of surgery and all that stuff. The whole time my brother was rehabilitating from his leg and going, watching my brother deteriorate from the pain pills they had him on. I told myself that I'd rather die from pain than die from fentanyl or, you know, pain pills. And, um, you know, I gained a lot of weight. Derek was losing a lot of weight. We didn't look like twins anymore. And um, I talked myself out of my ear. But, um, yeah, I ended up not doing pain pills, having the surgery, and it fixed my shit. And now uh, the doctor I met, so I always tell people, if you get a doctor that gives you the wrong answer than what you're looking for, at least get a second opinion or try and talk to a different doctor. Um, this guy told me he he said that there's a 50% chance that they could go in and shave out the disc in my back and that it would um, that it would be effective, that I wouldn't be in so much pain. He said there is about a 50% chance. There's also a 50% chance it'll make it worse. So I was like, dude, I'm, I'm a gambling man, but I'm not taking that, you know, that yeah. thing sucks, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and then I, you know, went through that pain for a year, became a roof restoration specialist or like a, a storm restoration specialist and worked my ass off. Every day was in the worst amount of pain and um, still watching everything on Instagram and all this skating stuff was killing me. And um, finally, I was, I was like, I'm going to talk to this other surgeon about it, you know, back surgery. So I talked to a sports medicine doctor and he was like, Whatever that guy told you was BS. He's, he must not have that. Um, he must not be competent in his work. He said, "I bet you." He goes, "I bet. I bet you a hundred dollars. You'll be a hundred percent in four weeks." And I was like, "Well, I'd be able to do this again." And I showed him some of my clips from back in the day. He goes, "If that's what you love." And so I was like, "Well, get set it up." They just happened to have a week. Um, the following week, you know, this is after COVID and stuff. He was like, you know, the following week I could get in there and get the back surgery and. Um, it was insane. I, there's no way that this wasn't God working through some magical ways because, you know, three weeks later I was ready to skate again and the scar hasn't even, hadn't even all the way healed. And I was ready to rock. I was no pain at all. And, um, yeah, man. I mean, ever since then it's been just, I've got injuries all the time, but you know, nothing serious, thank God. And, um, we get a lot of motivational stuff from people like, well, they'll, they'll say, thanks for sharing your story. Like I've got four months clean or, um, hey man, just seeing you guys back on skates makes my fat ass want to skate. We'll see shit like that all the time. And we don't do it because we make money. I mean, there's like, like Derek said, there's some pros who make money in skating. There's some people who whole life is dedicated to skating, but right now our life, we're blessed to have money from the job that we do. You know, the, it's actually a career and, um, we like to put money back into skating. So I've supported a ton of different companies. I support people who are doing their thing. Um, I buy more products than I care to admit. Um, I just want to show you guys something real quick. Can you see all that? Oh shit! Nah. <laughs> what? And that's just one. That's just one corner of that closet. So you know, somebody said something that kind of got on my nerves. And like, I'm still a sensitive dude. I still get mad about certain things. Um, somebody said, "Well, how much stuff are you buying off a of blade trade? Are you actually supporting the industry?" And it made me so mad. But I mean, that's a good question, right? That's a good question. Like hindsight, looking back at it, 
but I want, you know, I'll take my big long messages like we used to do uh, <laughs> bag, and then I'll just erase it. And be like, you know, a cooler head is prevailed. And um, I, I buy a lot of stuff from a lot of people, and I support a lot of companies. And so much so that they make a joke here, and they say, don't ever let my friends be sponsored by a skate company because the, the skate industry is one business. You know, because I, I buy a ton of skates. And, um, I know we donate a lot of skates. We donate a lot of stuff to different countries. We've done that a lot lately. Um, anybody, when we go to skate parks and there's like a biker or a skateboarder that's like, oh, rollerblading's so cool. I used to do that. Man, where can I get a pair of skates? I give them my number and then we usually get them hooked up with a pair of skates. So um, there's a lot of that that goes on behind the scenes. And, you know, we, we try and push our sport. We got our kids into it. Um, my son isn't as good as Derek's son, but he loves it just as much. Uh, Derek's son is a freaking problem he's gonna be a problem one day he is so that's good cool. i mean yeah. for, for being eight years old he's a little monster so it's that's pretty awesome cool, but... Dude, uh, sorry I, I was gonna say i, I love i love first of all both your aspects on that and your your takes on that is incredible and i love that there's so many skaters out there that have kids that are skating getting into skating like I, I didn't know that your kid skated, which is awesome to hear. But like Jimmy Shudo also he posts like videos of his kids skating. Absolutely. It's incredible. See how hyped they are too. I was just talking to my buddy Maddie from Canada and he's just put his he sent me a video the other day of his son on skates for the first time. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. I'm like, does he like it? And he's like, Yeah, he woke up this morning, first thing he did was put his skates on and went down yes. the driveway. I'm like, Oh, that's awesome. It's like I feel like with all the things that you two have been through, something like that would keep you motivated as well not even just with skating but like your health in general or staying away from the drugs and all that like that's so motivating and it's inspiring for other people as well that haven't necessarily gone through that but just in general just to take care of yourself look after yourself look after other people because that stuff is so important too and now that we're older we're adults where we can look back at these things on like mature eyes and realize what we've done and what we've experienced and how to push that onto other people too. So thank you guys for sharing absolutely. those stories. That's incredible. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I want to touch on a couple more things. I feel like we could talk to you guys for a long time. I still want to touch on a few more things before we get into, we'll ask uh, the live chat if anyone has questions in a bit. But um, it seems like your skating now is like very inspired. You seem to be on a mission together. Like, is there anything that you're working towards? Is there anything that you're working on? And what's your general mission and motivation nowadays? Well, I'm going to answer this real quick, just with a little piece. We are trying to get our agent, Richard Johnson, to drop this damn YouTube edit we just filmed the other day. And he is so freaking busy. It's like, you know, can we start like a Patreon for Richard Johnson so he doesn't have to do any other work and he can just start working on skating constantly? Because <laughs> be nice. The guy will put out a video a day if he has if there's enough money in it. And he yeah. gets so, he's busy, he's a dad, you know, but um, we've got that edit coming out, uh, which we're kind of proud of. We skated our asses off just one day straight. Um, there's really nothing except for us just going out and enjoying ourselves and filming it and um, – we do like five tricks each so we don't expect it to go anywhere we're not like oh we're gonna win competitions like when we went to the windy city riot last summer we weren't like oh we're gonna go get first we were just like we're gonna go do our thing and hopefully not make a fool out of ourselves and we had the best time ever you know and um when we went to the cameras open um you know and that was God, that was pretty eye-opening because it's like, God damn, people are good these days. <laughs> but at the same time, it was like when I got hurt, my brother being there to help me get off the street course, that was huge for me, you know. And um, that's what I longed for while I was watching my brother go through what I had already been through and wanted to have my brother back in my life. Um, when I got him back, that was a moment that, like, truly touched my heart because um, a lot of people were like, oh, or like, filming me on the ground like oh, you know <laughs> my brother came out of nowhere and was like come on man and then we both ran it off the street course which was huge for me and um yeah, we're very fortunate that we've had each other throughout this journey i think you need to turn down your volume you you sound like a little distorted it keeps going in and out i don't know if like your headphones oh. are dying or it keeps like coming Maybe. in and then going out i i was just i was I just turning down think Turn it down on my shit. Yeah. On my phone. 
I don't know. Maybe I should just talk less and let you guys get to know my brother better. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, You sound good. You sound good now. You sound good now. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted people to be able to hear you instead of being like. Oh. Yeah, I bet. Well, thank God <laughs> you did that two hours into this thing. So now they're all like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, how, how does how do you look at skating now compared to Mike and Derek 2000, 2005? Something like that. Like, how how do you look at skating now e- e- in the sense of like how you can improve as a skater? What you look at in skating when you go out every day? Oh, we used to compete more against each other, and now we push each other more, which is really cool. Yeah, and there's there's uh there's a little more caution to it. You know, we used to just throw caution to the wind because we thought we were invincible, but now it's like. We, we know our limits. We kind of have, you know, a little bit more uh, of a reserved attitude when it comes to skating, but we're still trying to progress every day. You know, it's that will never change. We always are trying to be better than we were yesterday, whether it's, you know, in our everyday life or rollerblading. You know, that's kind of our motto. And also getting back up. That's one thing that we always have to do. You fall 50 times, get up 51. But... Uh, I don't know, as far as skating goes, it's like uh, there's we're not we're not as psychotic as we used to be. Like I used to my brother was afraid to watch me skate. He still is. Like Mike has the least amount of confidence in me. He'll always be Come like, on, man. Oh, no, like before I hit the ground, my brother is screaming, No <laughs> Do I scream when you're skating? Am I trying to mess around? I don't know. Know, he cares, you know, but we're just getting older and we're, we kind of got that dad attitude now, you know? I feel like, um, I feel like have, twins have like okay. a special bond, uh, you know, just to play devil's advocate here where you guys like feel like seem like, uh, you know, brothers can be close, but you guys seem like very, very close. Like you share a lot of things, uh, a lot of, you know, parallels in life and, for me, just on the outside looking in, it just seems like an overprotective factor. Like even me with my close friends when they're about to fall, I'm like, nah, mm-hmm. like I don't care if I fall. Like I, I, I'll fall all day, but if one of my buddies is about to fall, I'm like, ooh, like you know, it's it's always like. But I, I can uh, I can I can relate to that. I'm sure it's like even more so for you guys being like twins and as connected as you are. Mm-hmm. Let um, me address this because yeah. if you watch yourself get hurt all the time, I mean you're. It's, okay, if you watch the movie Saltless Water from that JB made way back in the day, Yo, yeah. Um, to start the crash section, my brother goes to do a 540 over like, it's like a three foot, three foot, three foot drop. It's like nine feet this way, nine feet this way. And he slipped on leaves right at the top, and there's a bike rack at the bottom. And I'm witnessing my brother's death while he's upside down. And if you hear the noise that's in the background, it's not my brother, it's me. And I'm going, yeah, you know, and... It was the worst thing to try and watch and not make a noise. It's not like I know I'm doing it, but like when my brother sticks on an alley fish frame, it's just I, I, I can't control it. I'm like, that's why I'd rather not skate or I'd rather not watch him do it unless if it's scary. But it goes back to the AZ days when Derek tried to 540 a gigantic double set. And I, the, the crowd was cheering him on at a killer be killed competition. And I knew my brother was going to die. And I was like, <laughs> This is terrible that you guys are chanting and cheering them on. You, my, my brother is going to die, and it's in tech. Is it in tech two or quality, Derek? Uh, quality, and then uh, what, what was this, that other guy's video? Um, I can't remember. But he goes to do it, and he winds up, and he does this gigantic five forty, and lands on the last three stairs, and hits his tailbone on the ground, and completely accordions. And you just see him go, <laughs> and I'm just like, I, I told you guys like, not to encourage him. him. Yes, I mean, yeah. came out of his eyeballs. <laughs> it is the killer be killed competition. They, I feel like they, sure. when you name something like that, you're setting yourself yeah. up for kind of these kind of moments. It just shows but, the era of yeah. skating, how skating was back then. I can't picture a killer yeah. be killed contest in 2024. <laughs> no, I mean, I feel like if you had it these days, like maybe like it'd be called "Be Safe and Go Home." Yeah, be safe and have fun. Yeah, yeah be safe and have fun. <laughs> exactly. 
Um, so for me, I just got one more thing before we get into questions. And Austin, you might have a couple more things yourself. But personally, um, you guys are obviously very invested in the culture. And by the way, like I just beside all that, I just want to say like congrats on your journey. Like the fact that you've Thank had you. all these injuries, had all these um, intense moments in life and ups and downs. And you're still here today healthy with uh you know your children and a good career and great head on your shoulders and pushing a good message so i just want to say thank you for that and appreciate you sharing that with thank us you. and it's a testament to how tough you guys are but i'm curious obviously you're invested in skating for you know close to three decades at this point you're still involved you're still putting on skates supporting the industry being a part of it um where do you see the future of skating going? Do you think it's something that lives on and comes back to be healthy? Do you think it's something that kind of slowly goes away? Or do you think it's something that just we share uh, as, as our group? Like, what, what do you think the future of skating has uh, in store for us? Go ahead, Derek. Well, yeah, since I only came back a year ago, you know, or maybe, yeah, like a year and a half now, I think. Um, but I, I feel like, um, I mean, with, <laughs> later, later. <laughs> I'll be back. There you go. But I, I, I mean, with how special of a place it has in my heart, I can only imagine how many other rollerbladers feel the same. That I don't think it'll ever die. If anything, um, you know, it'll always be something that we do for the love. And I think when it has that type of foundation, I don't, I don't think it can go anywhere but up. You know, and. I, I, everything history repeats itself so you never know i mean we could have another uh ramp up other than just you know all the companies that are benefiting from all the old rollerbladers coming back um and you know stimulus checks i, I think that we, we 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 could have another um spike in popularity and you know with uh, with this skateboarder and his you know i i forget his name i wouldn't even want to mention him just because I don't want to give him any publicity, but the guy who's just solely out to destroy roller, rollerblading, the skateboarder who puts out these anti-rollerblading messages and stuff. Um, I think the fact that we linked up with quad skaters and everything, I love that. I think it's healthy for our sport. But um, Ricardo Lino was talking about um, this guy who he's, he's just, he's from the skateboarding industry and his, so sole mission is just a bag on rollerblading. I, I can't think of his name right now. I don't have enough space in my hard drive for haters like that, but yeah, um, I wish I would have done my homework, you know, before the no, show. No, I mean, I, 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 I mean, <laughs> screw him at the end of the day. Like, you know, um, there's uh, those, those people exist and I feel like they're the last of a dying breed because at one point, like maybe they could have looked tough, but now they just look like insecure and weak. So it's like the only people who are doing that are just like happy to expose themselves as insecure, weak. Um, Cause that's, that's, it just seems like a thing that's going away, but it's, you know, yeah. you, there's, a, there's always going to be those individuals, sadly. And I agree with you, even though you forgot his name, probably best to just let it be. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, my thing is this, if, if we still see that love that we have for skating that has made us 100% addicted to it, and that's transferring to people like our kids, that's like the biggest hope for me that this will carry on no matter what. It's just how do we expose that to more people and how do we get those kids to have that feeling because all, all four of us know and everybody watching knows that when you do something that you didn't think was possible, but it started off as something you imagined or thought you could do, and then you do it, that's one of the best feelings in the world. And that could be done in so many different things in life, but skating is such a cool form and a cool way to do it that you can express with your own style. And it's like a painting. You can, you, it's just like I sit, tell people in recovery. It's like, you can make your skating, skating as beautiful as you want it to. It could be something you always work on. Um, you can keep working on it. You can keep working on your tricks. You can keep working on your style. You can go even further. And like me and Derek always get um, people said we look like Power Rangers at the Windy City Riot um, <laughs> because I 
I match my hat with my shirt. I'm about to say you got the red and, and the yellow, you know, right now. Yeah, and, you know, and, that's and two that, out of five we, at least. This is the way we looked at um, Windy City Riot, and usually I. So my mom used to dress my brother in red and me in blue so she could tell the difference uh, because we have – so we were completely identical. I, 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 mean, I would have just – if I was one of your parents, I would have just gave you a little a, a little scar right here, one of you guys. <laughs> yeah. A little hot knife. I'm sorry. Just to just shave kidding. one of our eyebrows like <laughs> in the middle right here. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But my mom has triplets too. And so um, with them, I don't think she really had to do as much because – they were always a little bit more different looking growing up. Now they look a lot alike uh, to the point where we kind of get them confused if they're not like looking. I mean, even if they're looking at us and talking to us, sometimes I get confused. It's so crazy because it's like, we see that as normal. We were always, I mean, people are like, is it weird to have a twin? If I punch you, is he going to feel it? It's like, you know, no, probably not. But we probably will both beat you up, you know? And yeah. it's like, <laughs> we also have triplets like, too. So yeah, my mom has. Bags. My yeah. mom has. Yeah, yeah. So we've got at least five people that are going to whoop your ass. But, um, You're never fighting just one, you know. Just so you know. <laughs> yeah. But it's something that, like, I think that. Man, I don't even remember what the question was. Um, I just think that there's something to be said about like us teaching other people how to rollerblade, us getting people into it. I think that that's something that will keep the sport alive. And um, when. When we talk about haters um, on like Instagram, I've never like gone viral or anything, but I've had some some of my like clips get like almost two hundred thousand views or something like that. And the crazy thing is, you'll get like all these people that are like fruit booters, you know, and you're like, oh, like don't call me that, you know, and like yeah, yeah, yeah. then when that doesn't work, they're like, you know, what's the hardest part about rollerblading? And it's like, mm-hmm. you're know, like they, they just draw attention to themselves to look really not only like homophobic but like like you know like toxically masculine like you know it's just like a lot of that kind of hate like you said is it's 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 prehistoric and it's like primitive and it's yeah it's so it's i mean the way life is evolving that those people are going to weed themselves out and yeah they look stupid making fun of us so i i, I mean you got to think about the people making those comments they're not like the manliest men doing the most like <laughs> successful things like you know what i mean they're like 13 year old dorks behind a computer like that sure. wouldn't say it to your face and right. just like you know it's it's their little you know, they hate themselves and <laughs> they, they want to yeah. go out. They, they don't even have a profile picture. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> well, it's, yeah, yeah and th- that, that we, we, I don't know, for me personally, I'm, I'm, I'm like just after years of seeing that kind of stuff, just over giving it attention. But I agree, like um, there's a lot of myths and negative uh, associations that people can pull out to use against rollerblading that can be very frustrating to hear, but we just got to keep doing us. And I think, Absolutely. It's going in, in the right direction. So, mm-hmm. and I, I agree with you on on both of what you said um, regarding how to like keep the future going, teach teach the future, inspire the kids, get the kids on blades, keep that going. Um, yeah, because so, who, yeah. who knows? Like your kids could be talking about skating in school, and their friends could be like. Oh, what do you mean exactly. skating? And that's how we all got into it pretty much too. It's like you see a kid at school skating and you're like, yo, that looks sick. I want to try that. And they get to their friends and they have a whole group of little kids that start skating and it'll grow. It, it's, it's sad that it took a couple of decades for us to like mature and have our own kids to like create other skaters. But, you know, whatever, whatever works, it works. So that's awesome to see that. Um, I, I did want to – I was going to ask about the clothes because – I didn't. We were talking in the beginning about like how people thought you were the same person for so long. I didn't know if you sure. specifically dressed the way you do with your contrasting colors to let people know that you are different people. Like Derek, have you ever <laughs> have you ever like gone out skating and you're like, okay, let's let's head out. Derek comes down the stairs and you're wearing the same color. You're like, oh shit, I gotta go back nah. upstairs. <laughs> that don't happen. <laughs> never, never happened. My wow. Whole wardrobe, my whole wardrobe is red. Um, since, oh shit. Uh, since I was a kid and my mom would, you know, have, she buy two of everything, red and blue. Like yeah. I have an obsession that my mom created for the color red and it's caused so many problems growing up. Like when I first moved to Arizona and I got off the airplane and I'm walking and there was, around it, there. You, you, you moved to a crypt neighborhood probably. Right? <laughs> and, and you were, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I mean, red folk shoes and a red hat with 
red jumpsuit and people are like, what's up, cuz? Like, yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm here to rollerblade. <laughs> that's funny um would, would you guys mind if we uh got into a couple of these questions we have some questions sure. in the chat and we'll get into a couple of these before we let you go is that okay absolutely okay uh, as, as always super chats come first and we've been a bit slow on that but i think it's okay to acknowledge this one uh it's not a question really but peter Tall says thank you for sharing your story mates Really a true motivation to all of us, especially for those also in recovery. No question, just keep rolling. Thank you very Hell much. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, we split our super chats with our guest. Um, so thank you very much. Our first question comes from Landon, which is a very basic question. And we've had a nice podcast so far. I don't want to create a uh, controversy, but they said, who would win in the game of Blade? Hope this isn't a sore topic. Or something <laughs> Blade, I I That's a good one. What is the game on? One obstacle. Oh, that's a good. Also, let, let, let's do rail, rail, ledge, gap. Okay, park. I'll break it down for you. Okay. I have way more tricks on stuff than my brother does, but he does the tricks way better than I do that he does. So I can't true topside anything. Nothing. Like nothing. It's unless I'm already in a trick and switching to it. My brother can true top worm, true all that crap and it he does it with style and i've got i can only spin all the way around to it um like alley tire topside swell topside acid alley fish brain my brother has a way better chance if it's if we're doing like a true spin war i don't know why but guy couldn't ride backwards on transition for 25 years anybody <laughs> could true spin to anything you know <laughs> i mean I, I also feel like a lot of people from our era have that issue because we weren't born with a lot of skate parks around kids now True. we have so many skate parks around no it excuses took, uh, I, I was skating for like three four <laughs> years i was skating for like three four years before i even got on my first mini ramp you know what i mean and by sure. the time i did i didn't know what the hell i was doing so sure. um can relate um murder militia says uh well i think we already touched on that question actually um we did Ah, Mike Deasy, this is a good one. Where did the kick Shot. out of trick? Oh, go ahead. Where sorry, did sorry, the... sorry, sorry. No, sorry. Uh, Mike Deasy goes, where did the kick out of tricks come from? Whose style was the best to you, past and present? Uh, it's an interesting okay. question. It's very personal. Okay, so I used to be a really big TJ Weber fan. I mean, I still am. The guy had so much style, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I would ride, I, back then I rode Oxygen Skates and. Um, it was just I always wanted to do more with my tricks because I could re I couldn't really switch up like crazy, and I've got kind of big feet and I, they've always been ten and a half, you know. And um, I would do like Luke Kang's out of a lot of stuff because that was kind of the era I came from. And um, like I think I'm in like saltless water doing a, a sweat stance to Luke Kang off the handrail, and ever since then it's just been what I love to do. And now they call it an abstract, but it's just what I can do to spice up my tricks, you know, and um, I think it's all about freshening up your own style and doing it your own way. And even if you only have five tricks, do some, throw a little razzle dazzle in there to spice it up, you know, and that's kind of what I do. I don't know. I agree. I love that. And, and kids out there, you know, if you, if you, if you want to spice it up and you're doing grinds and you're, you know, jump off your grind you know you can jump off it yeah, you can grab really. off it you can spice up you can kick off it uh so that's i think that's the thing to me that makes blading special it's not so much the focus on the trick but it's the little intricacies that make them your own mm -hmm. so absolutely. Uh, well two people that, could do the same trick and it'll be completely different absolutely that's the beauty of one of the beauties of our sport yeah. and shout out okay, to think... murder murder militia because uh nate is a good friend of mine and um i just want to say hello and then I do want to say a shout out to one of my sponsors that um, this guy, Sean Freeman, hooks me up with a lot of like supplements for my old ass. And uh, it's something that we'll take before we go skate. And, you know, it helps. There's also something you take after you skate, which is like a recovery formula. And um, it helps a ton. But um, shout out to, um, you know, it's it's Nutri Shop St. Pete. If any of you guys are looking for supplements, that's a really awesome place to get them from. So. Oh yeah, and you shout out to murder, murder militia, murder militia. I'm not ignoring your questions, but uh, <laughs> I, I feel like that the last subject we touched on kind of talked about that. The 
how can we can nurture skating for the future and yeah and sure. the, uh overcome the negative stigma of, of blading i feel like just coincidentally those are the last two things we spoke about so i didn't want to go back sure. and touch on that again but um i think this is a good fun one uh before we let you go and also ask your final shout outs but um tennessee hill says what's their favorite skate video of all time respectively both mike and derek yeah we need we need good answers for these i, I was excited about this question too <laughs> who wants to Brain go first fear gone. Brain fear gone best video of all time same uh you know i i don't have a favorite man like the transcend uh day of the rope those kind of videos man they just held a different place in my heart man and like all the be unique videos they it like it was different for every era man those those videos they were like game changing like brain fear gone anything joe navron like oh my god man how could you have one favorite video man every true every, every, Every season, that I had a new favorite, you know? Like, sure, but Joe Nav anything Joe Navron was my favorite. That's a good one. I was expecting to hear something Minnesota. Drew and I was waiting to hear oh, oh, so Adventures close. in Rollerblading. No, but uh, Minnesota has always, and great answer, by the way. Uh, Minnesota has always had such a strong presence in rollerblading from the beginning in my beginning, which is hoax too. like the first video I ever, I ever saw had a lot of those guys that you talked about and always just had a strong presence into the mind game scene, into all the other scenes. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, huge shout, shout out to you guys and everyone in that. Um, everyone, I want to thank you for your questions, but before we let you go, do you have any, and both, I would like you guys both to answer if possible, uh, parting words, shout outs, thank yous. I guess we'll start it with Derek first. And then, we'll, and then we'll go with Mike, if that's okay. That's of course, but then I'm gonna, after Mike talks, I'm going to be like, damn, I should have said that. But man, I've got so many shout outs and there's just so many people out there that have helped me along the way. And Emmy Parejo is my number one fan and she has brought me back to life as far as keeping me in shape in my 40s and being able to skate at the level that we're skating at right now. Um, but people like... Uh, you know, all these Minnesota cats um, that wanted me to make a shout out to not forget, you know, but like Jeff Howard, Chris Farmer, all these people that are still doing it. And uh, Shane McClay with Monday Night Skate, you know, he plays a huge part. In people getting together out here and us having a community still. Um, but there's people like Darren Brodock, um, who's one of my longtime best friends. Um, and uh, Ben Weiss, rest in peace. Um, he will forever be missed. And, um, you know, but I could just do this forever, but all of my Minnesota homies, people like Arsenio Patterson, another OG out there that's holding it down. Um, I just, there's too many to name, man. I'm just going to have to say everybody that I've talked to. I'm sorry. I forgot all your names in this shout out, but I love you. Hey, Arsenio's in Minnesota now? No, no, no. no oh, no. he's just saying it general. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he's been in a car accident. <laughs> that's billy's line you can't take that from billy <laughs> Dude, billy hey before we go any further one of my most like memorable craziest things i've ever seen of yours i mean besides all the amazing tricks you've landed over the years you, i want to know what it was like from your point of view when you got hit by that car that was the oh. most insane shit in barcelona yeah which which time okay. barcelona is yeah, Barcelona. Yeah. Have you been hit by multiple? <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, I've been I've been hit by three different cars. Like, yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Twice because I was a, I was a bike messenger for a long time, so I, I got hit on bicycles twice and once on blades. But the first one was on blades uh, in the um, in Barcelona, and there's like two streets, and uh, one street and another. And I remember just like uh, I tried to jump into the first one and I went like kind of slow and jumped high. And then I was like, I had someone watching the streets and they said it was good. And I just assumed both streets were good. And then I, I went to 180. I went a little faster. And then when I turned around, I was like already in this, the first street. And I was like, OK, like I'm going to the second street. It's not like an emergency. It should be clear. Uh, I wasn't really thinking, of course, like, of course, like it's different in Europe and certain places with the cars and the how it goes. And then I just went out and I looked and I was like, oh, there's a car coming at me pretty fast. So I just like, like looked at it and I turned and I just kicked both of my feet into the bumper. 
And then it just like, as I kicked it, I kicked it as hard as I could. And I leaned back and it was like pushing my ankles back. And my feet were starting to go under the car for a second, but I was just like holding out. And then I just like hit the brakes and I just went, got, you know, went my own different way. And then I was like, oh man, that hurt. And I had to like go to the hospital and a huge recovery process, like a year. But um, it, did, it didn't roll over your ankles at all or anything? No, but it just bent it really far oh. back like that. Like I thought like, it kind of like rolled yeah. over the side of your yeah. boot or something. No, I had like Oof. super ligament problems, but, that was but it was fast. Tough year. Like, you know, I think you guys know like all these accidents, like one second, everything's fine. And next second, it's just like, wow, that happened. And it's funny, like uh, everyone who like looks back nowadays at it, like Bellino, like two months ago was like, you could have made that turn, bro. I was like, yeah, no <laughs> I know I couldn't make the turn. Like, you weren't expecting like, a car there. It was like 16 years ago, and I wasn't expecting the car, and the situation yeah. was different. Like, and right. like, even La- even Levy like looked at me recently. He was like, "That was pretty stupid." I was like, "Yeah, you, were, you, had, to be, you had to be there for the situation." But yeah. it is what it is. You live with it. Cool. Life goes on, and but yeah. I feel like we just made. But you're the last still thing killing about it. Me. You're, you're I, still I, killing I, it, though. I appreciate that. I feel yeah, like we made the Austin, last thing about man. me, but the last thing has to be your shout out now. No, so. no, no, no. I got to shout out to you guys. Austin, the way you've been doing your thing, man. We watch your clips all the time, dude. The style on the True Spinelli oh, yeah. Topside Souls is uncanny. Wow. And yeah. I mean, now you're doing a lot of like the wizard skating, transitioning into rollerblading stuff. That's awesome. That's just pushing the sport even more. And um, plus you have your old school roots of doing just straight hammers. So when you combine those two together, you know, a lot of people you'll see it on rollerblading, rollerblading, and all these groups like, no, no, there aren't any more hammers. You know, it's like you're not watching enough rollerblading, you know? Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, you know, I, it's just like certain skateboarders that talk trash. It's like something about them doesn't feel right, so they have to talk trash. And, it's, you know, I, yeah. I love the sport we're in, I, I love all aspects of it. I think the quad thing they're combining in is going to save us as far as like bringing more into the sport and, um, combining it with more talent or giving people to be able to cross cross reference and cross into a different a different style of what they're doing which is you know watching them on rollerblades watching rollerbladers like Montre on roller skates that's insane um but um one thing i kind of want to leave everybody with is like this is something that i've learned through recovery that applies to every aspect of your life and that's if you take every day if you try and be better than who you were yesterday don't compare yourself to anybody else online or like anywhere else. Just compare yourself to who you were yesterday. And if you've made advancements and you keep doing that, you will grow into a life that is far beyond what you could ever imagine. And um, I'm living proof of that. And for somebody who didn't think they could come back from the bad decisions that they've made and the, the people they've hurt and the, the relationships that they've ruined to where I am now, I'm just living proof that every day is – you know, a testament to how amazing life can get. And um, I do have some shout outs I'd like to do. Um, I've got Justin at One Magazine, um, all the guys at One Magazine. I, I really appreciate everything they've done for us, the, you know, the, the continuous coverage. Um, I've got my entire family for all the support that they've given us over the years, um, even when we were out making terrible decisions. Um, R.S. Eden for saving both my brother and I's life and all the people we've met through there that – Um, even though a very few, many of us are still around that are successful, there's a lot of people we've met along the way that have played a huge part in our journey. Um, WWFR, which is a recovery center out here. Um, it's just a place where we go for meetings that help save my life. Um, Paul and Carolyn, um, all the guys in my recovery group, um, Dustin, Tim, Nick, and Wade, especially, um, you know, there, there are a lot of people to name, but all the Minnesota crew, Jeff Howard, everybody that's um, recently let us in back into the group and have, oh, you know, welcomed us with open arms. It's been amazing. And, um, you know, just roll Minnesota and all that they do for us and Butch, um, everybody um, out here. I mean, the scene is really alive and well, and you wouldn't think so with all this snow that we have all the time, but it's, it's been amazing. And, um, the entire rollerblading community for allowing us to come back after what we've been through and not be like the old BMAG message board. And um, it's good to see everybody's changing and being more open-minded and um, willing to accept people for where they're at and who they are and their skating. And 
letting their skating speak for themselves, which has been just a giant blessing for us over the last, I don't know, three years, two years, whatever, but 30 years in general. So um, we appreciate you guys for this opportunity. This has been amazing to be able to be on your platform and share our story. So big shout out to you guys and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming on the show. This has been incredible. I feel like there's still so much more. Maybe we'll have you on again another time at a later date. But just in Anytime. general, this has been this has been awesome. Uh, thank you for sharing your stories, both of you. I, I feel like it's very inspirational, motivational for a lot of the viewers, and I think they're going to get a lot of out of it. So thank you again oh. so much for doing that. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And, and thank was, you, Richard, for setting this up. We are agent. He, Sorry, uh, Richard. He's listening in the car right now. He just commented that he's driving. <laughs> <laughs> so he's always watching over you. <laughs> and, we want to, and we want to see that edit, Richard, whenever you, you free yeah, up. On, <laughs> Take a day off. We want to see this edit. We look forward to seeing I, – I look forward to seeing what you guys have coming in the future too as well. So definitely Thank you keep guys. killing it out Ditto. there. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video if you enjoyed this. And stay tuned. we got more po podcasts coming for you. So we'll see you then. Peace, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Take it easy.